Welcome to Rule of Thirds, an offshoot of our Screen Refresh podcast. Our goal every episode is to take a little break from watching and analyzing movies, to dive headfirst into some nostalgia, or just get a little creative. So every month we select a different topic and create a top three list that may or may not be near and dear to each of our hearts. Shoot us a message on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at Screen Refresh, or send an email to screenrefresh at gmail.com to let us know what your top three are or to suggest future topics. I'm your host, Tim, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Dean and Nick. Hello there. I'm Dean. That's correct. <laughs> Today we're taking a look at the animated films that have stuck with us, so settle in for some Rule of Thirds. That's the new intro song. You can use that. <laughs> I have to get another intro now. <laughs> so something that is, I know we've been pulling from childhood for these main show screen refresh. I know animated films are one of those things that almost uh, exclusively exist within our childhoods. And then some of them kind of grow with us. So how hard a time did you guys have with some of this animated film stuff? I realized this is not near and dear to my heart. And anim- I think in childhood animation was like TV shows for the most part. Yeah, I had a lot more TV shows that I watched as a kid. I I, I mean, obviously I have a list, but thinking of them. I would hope so. Like two came to mind and then I'm like, I mean, I don't think this spoils anything, but I'm like, am I just going to be a Disney guy? Like. I mean, Disney is just a powerhouse of animation, but especially when we grew up, that's, that was my <laughs> right. concern with Tim. Like, so is this just best animated movies by Disney? <laughs> I mean, like late um, '80s into the '90s was just a ball, like home run after home run for Disney Pixar. Yeah. Um. I mean, I two of the movies on my list are Disney. One is not. So, but that, I think that's to be expected for our generation, for sure. I mean, even today, like what? I guess you got DreamWorks uh, for kids to pull from, like that Secret Life of Pets and Shrek. That's that's Disney. I thought Secret Life of Pets. I don't think so. Yeah. That's not Pixar. I, I don't know. No, no. I think, I think that's, we'll get our. We'll get the producers to fact check that. Maybe that was Paramount. Yeah. Oh, then I, I guess there's a number of different studios then that. If if you're not Disney, you're DreamWorks. Even if you're not DreamWorks, you're that's who you are <laughs> in today's episode. <laughs> oh wait, that's not Disney. It must be DreamWorks. I keep wanting to say Disney DreamWorks. and survive long enough, you become DreamWorks. <laughs> yeah, Boss Baby was DreamWorks, <laughs> and then what was the other one? Secret Life of Pets, Illumination. Which one? Illumination. Illumination. So that one was like ah. dis- despicable Me. Right. Because I know yeah. there seems to be a lot more animated films popping up on like things like Netflix and whatnot now. Like I know, what was it, like Wish or something like that about the Luck Dragon. There's, uh, was it the the movie about the Mitchells or something like that with the robots? The Croods. Um, well, that was a yeah, wide so, release thing anyway. Yeah, that was a wide release. But yeah, like there's a ton of stuff popping up these days that, I mean, I'm less likely, I don't have my finger to the pulse of kids animation these days but i know it's a a case of these are probably a lot of the things that will just appear out of nowhere some kids gonna watch it and because of the the ease of use of just having it streaming it's gonna be yep i watched this movie 10 million times as a kid and this is what's gonna be ingrained in my brain someday so i don't know if it's easier now for us it's just we weren't streaming it it was the VHS never left the VCR and we just hit rewind. <laughs> the most terrifying thing as a child, which we'll get to my number one, is I had a VHS of this movie and I watched it and watched it to the point where it like essentially almost wore out. But this was never released on DVD until years later. So it was like once the VHS is gone... At that point, we didn't have the technology to like convert it to DVD ourselves. So it was a very precarious time. Tracking will not save you now. <laughs> Every viewing may be my last. <laughs> Childhood mortality. That's I when grow I learned weaker it. with every viewing. <laughs> it played. Just dust comes out of the VCR. <laughs> <laughs> Tell my wife I love her. 
It's like that cartoon, like. <laughs> 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 appropriate so yeah animated films guys uh do we want to start with number three i mean that's kind of why thing right i wanted to go with two let's tarantino <laughs> it let's two our favorite animated and tarantino one. films <laughs> i guess that's only kill bill right it has that one animated part yeah so which in itself seems like a good anime oh that's what i was gonna say i i didn't watch anime growing up i don't know how much you guys did but like that cuts off a whole other segment of animation my top three up. list is entirely anime <laughs> i thought it might be so yeah i mean that's good as we're not so, gonna cross i over. mean that's kind of the the alternate option aside from all disney and pixar and whatnot films is there's a ton of anime growing up I personally think we grew up in like the golden age of it. So love or hate it. I feel like the the later or like the later 80s throughout the 90s were just, just like a great time for really smooth, cool animation and a lot of fun ideas. So we'll get to that too. But you don't have to love anime. I just happen to. So who wants to start off with number three? I guess it's Nick or I this time. I'll go first. Okay. Next time it's Nick. Remember that. We'll go counterclockwise on our videos. That's in a straight line. <laughs> so, <laughs> my third movie, the one and two, I think I came up with just pretty easily. This one I had to like, I was on like Googling best animated movies of the 80s. I was like jarring my, <laughs> jar, or, uh, you know, trying to jar my memory. Like, what movies did I like <laughs> growing just up? Just ripping your list directly from I did from the same that. thing. <laughs> best animated oh, yeah, film. Well, it was more of a refresher. This. Yeah, I just had like, to refresh my mind. Going through the comedy episode, there were so many that we didn't think of leading up to it. And as we're discussing, it's like, oh, yeah, I remember this. I remember that. So I needed some kind of crutch to kind of jog my memory and remember all the animated classics from a kid. So what was it's, your number three, Dean? So this, were you going to say, Tim? Oh, I was going to say, like, it, it's honestly like I, I do the same thing that you guys did. Like, I, I pulled up a list. But a lot of these things, especially as we're going over over time, I slowly start to like unlock memories and remember shows or remember movies or things that I haven't thought about in so many years that like doing this list, all of a sudden I was taken back to like when I was seven on vacation kind of deal, sitting watching this movie for the first time. I remember what it smelled like outside. Like I remember what we did that night. I, I don't know if I'm losing current memories to regain these, but the show has been definitely helping with that. Who are you and what are we doing here? I'm a locksmith and I'm a locksmith. <laughs> so with this movie, there, there was a construct we invented called time. And that started about, oh, I don't know, 1985? 3,000 years ago. Oh, time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know when time started. But I mean, uh, as as humans understand, depends on it. who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> we still don't know. But before time, there was this land uh, filled with dinosaurs. Did it have a name? Uh, it was just called the Land Before Time. <laughs> the creators of an American tale comes a timeless classic for the whole family. Wow. George Lucas and Steven Spielberg present a Don Bluth film. Bye. Alone, I am. Five friends share the world's first adventure. You want to go with me? Yeah! Shark oh. An adventure in the land of the dinosaurs. The land before time. Rated G. Starts Friday at theaters everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so you know that dinosaurs had to make this list. I mean, this is one of the movies where I was looking at the list of like, best of the 80s and this was on there and i was like oh shit yeah like i i watched this movie a lot when i was a kid it, it's hard to recall all the scenes from the movie but like i definitely loved this growing up and it's something i haven't seen probably since i was a kid but Same. um it was part of like a like a powerhouse of at least the filmmakers had a good run of movies here which oh where the hell are my notes I so this notes. is my honorable mention because I have the same notes for that. So Don Bluth is responsible for this, right. as well as Peach Dragon, Secret of Nim, An American Tale, Land Before Time, All Go <laughs> All Dogs Go to Heaven, Titan A.E. Rock he had his own renaissance. Yep. He, 
he directed the animation stuff on Pete's Dragon. I think there was like a co-director who was like the main director. Um, he also directed Dragon's Lair, the the video game, yep. which I didn't mm-hmm. play, but I know it was very popular I and very it a lot. revered. Um, I think Bluth was part of the the animation team that was like I think they were at Disney at the time, didn't like what was going on. They decided to go rogue and form their own stuff, and that's when we got all the the Bluth things. Because yep. I think he did like Five and American Tale was one of the ones I grew up on. Yeah, Rock Amer- Noodle, yep. as you said. Yep. Anastasia as well in the nineties yep. and Titan A. I think Nick might have said that. But yeah, like he had a crazy run. Like I, I think yeah, I've it was seen like a direct Secret competitor of Nim. for a while. Right. I think I've seen Secret of Nim. I don't remember too much about it. I remember Five Goes West, an American Tale, sequel to an American Tale. But not really yeah, not the first that one. one. More. Yeah, that's one I watched more. Um, that, I think that was James Stewart's last movie because he did the voice of, I think, the dog cowboy. Yep. Oh, interesting. I didn't realize that. Uh, the writer on this movie went on, Stu Krieger, Krieger went on to write two DCOMs, Xenon, Girl of the 24th Century, and <laughs> Smart House with uh, Kathy Siegel. Well, Zetus Lapidus. <laughs> <laughs> um, the movie, if you don't, if you're not familiar with it, is about a group of dinosaurs. There's Littlefoot the Brontosaurus, which, yes, Brontosaurus is officially a dinosaur again. Not a Patasaurus. Um, Ducky the... is either a Sauralophus or a Parasaurolophus. I'm not sure which one. There's Sarah the Triceratops, Petrie the Pteranodon, and the Spike the Stegosaurus who doesn't speak but is voiced regardless by none other than Frank Welker. Not a big surprise. <laughs> <laughs> he just makes sounds as far as I remember. I mean, it was either that or Kevin Michael Richardson, so it's, <laughs> take your pick. Mel, IMDb has Mel Blanc listed, too, as doing some dinosaur sounds, like uncredited. I don't know the story behind I, that. Sometimes I wonder if they just get like those prolific actors to throw them in just because it's something of... I've loved your work in the past. Here, have a free paycheck because you'll get like royalties or something. Yeah, it's like I want. It's like a just a an Easter egg almost. Like I want you just to be a part like of my Bruce product. Willis was the voice of Spike in the Rugrats movie? I think. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds and familiar. I don't, I don't understand why, but it's like free paycheck. <laughs> I've never seen it. Yeah, same. I think George. I mean, imagine you like George Clooney doing like a dog or something on South Park. I think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the show at least. But um, that's funny. Uh, so these these are all babies of their species, and there's a big <laughs> earthquake. Babies. babies. There, uh, there's a big earthquake at the beginning of the movie after this attack from the local Tyrannosaurus <laughs> menace. <laughs> um, and uh, it separates all of these uh children from the herd and littlefoot's mom dies like why is the mother always dying in these movies at the beginning or is it just bambi i don't know this and bambi the mother dies i don't know i feel like a lot of either disney or disney pixar there's like no mothers (laughs) or like a lot of broken homes except that uh mrs incredible am i right (laughs) the thickest mom in disney Um, so they are lost, this group of dinosaurs, all voiced by, uh, kids, I think, except for Peach, well, Frank Welker and Petrie, uh, is voiced by an older dude who sounds like Robin, like, it could have been Robin Williams before Robin Williams was doing the manic genie thing. Um, like, he could have been Petrie the Pteranodon, which I guess he ended up doing in Fern Gully. Yeah. Uh, with Batty. It's kind of the same character, but this came before Fern Gully. So they're trying to get to the Great Valley to reunite with their family and, you know, hijinks ensue. And this is where I kind of forget what's in the rest of the movie. They're just kind of like (laughs) making their way across, you know, the land and trying to get, you know, reunited. Um, I remember there being something like, does somebody die or I remember there was like something sad in the first one. The mom died. Oh, wait, yeah, the mother dies. Dear sweet. Do you remember the way to the Great Valley? I guess so. But why do I have to know you're going to be with me? The mother dies, but there's also a a real-life tragedy associated with this movie that people probably know, which is the the voice actress 
the child for Ducky, she was, I think, killed by her father in real life. Oh, geez. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know too much story beyond that, but it's like, yeah, that's a horrible occurrence that's associated with the surrounding to this movie. But the movie itself is, I think, just has that sad part with the mom dying. And it's not too, like, brutal. We don't really see her die. You just kind of, like, the camera pans back and, like, she's saying, like, I'll always be with you. I'll be with you. Even if you can't see me. I don't even remember. Does she just, like, get trampled or something or she falls? It's like, it's just, she's, she gets scratched a, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> she, she gets scratched a little bit by sharp tooth, as they call the Tyrannosaurus. Um, there's like there's a massive fight and then the earthquake starts. So I don't know if it's just kind of implied that like she fell and like is just she's dying just like from that. Cuz she doesn't she doesn't get like seriously bitten or wounded by the T-Rex. I think it's just the impact from the earthquake and all that stuff. True. I remember having all of these like rubber hand puppet things for all of the land before time characters even though I don't think I watched it a ton. Like if we owned it, I watched it a couple times. But I was always a we're back a dinosaur story kid. Ah! Out of the prehistoric past. Into the streets of New York. Dinosaurs quick! Holy smokes! They've come to see the sights. Shake things up. And save the city. I am the master of fear. They're in danger. We gotta save them. Steven Spielberg presents We're Back, a dinosaur story. That's us. Rated G starts Wednesday at theaters everywhere. Oh, wait, I can't. I'm thinking of Prehysteria, and I can't think of what that one is. Of yours, the one you're talking about. I think has it might John also Goodman as the T Rex. Yes. Yeah. They're brought back by some Doc Brown kind of guy. I mean, something to he do with cereal, him, I think. Yeah, he gives him. Um, <laughs> I forget the name of it. I keep the oh, bad so that's an animation. brain drain. Yeah. But it makes them super smart. They go to New York. That's one of those movies that I thought I made up as a kid. And then like I refound it and was like, oh, okay. I'm validated now. I'm not sure if I've seen this surprisingly with my love of dinosaurs. It's one of those like, I think, passing by it and blockbuster kind of memories of the cover. But I don't think I've actually seen that. We're back. There's a Jurassic Park reference in it. Oh yeah, it came out after ninety three. Yeah, they're having a, they're in a parade, and you see Jurassic Park is playing at the local movie theater. Oh, and then they destroy the movie theater as a metaphor. <laughs> We're better. <laughs> We're gonna be the more lasting film. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do. You guys remember Prehysteria? Do you remember? Mm-hmm. That I remember movie? the name. I don't remember the film. Those were like just three random dinosaurs that were like babies that yeah the kids always had to hide them back. from authorities. They're like yeah, he gets these baby dinosaurs somehow, and I forget where the hell they came from. <laughs> I, don't I never remember, remember what they did in the whole movie. I just remember the kids constantly having to hide them from the adults. <laughs> Nothing else about it, and or maybe the like them playing with a train set. Right. I've never seen prehysteria. <laughs> we're gonna do it for screen refresh. Although a thousand percent makes sense that it's a Charles Band movie. Uh, what did he do? Uh, Charles Band, I think he owns like Full Moon Productions or something, but they do a ton of low budget hokey things that have a bit of charm to them. I think they did I, the first or some of the puppet masters. They did like all that kind of stuff. I think there's like three or four of them, too. Pretty hysterious. Maybe just two. But I think there was a few. Yeah, I think like uh, also uncredited in prehysteria, Frank Welker as dinosaurs. <laughs> I My know a guy. God, <laughs> who didn't give a paycheck to this guy? <laughs> I mean, I feel like do should I Venmo him just so we can join the club? Well, he was yeah. like the like um, he was like a smaller version of Mel Blank. I mean, he was huge in the seventies and eighties. So then come yeah. like the 90s, I mean, he wasn't as used as often, but he was a, his name is up there with the other pantheons of voice acting and stuff. He's probably in most of the movies on our lists. Yeah. More than I likely, mean, even yeah. to this day, he is still like banging out dozens of projects a year. So good for you, Frank Welker. Great, Frank Welker. Yeah, it's not too much to keep say on, for, me to, for me to say. 
about the land before time, but did you see any of the sequels? Because I think they made like nine I or think ten. To, nine or ten? I remember three. <laughs> I mean, at that point, it was like the land after time. <laughs> Some girl on Little YouTube Foot reviewed gets a all job. of them. And it was cool to see how the story actually progressed in a nice nutshell of a video because I did not want to sit through all of them. But pretty much just as you expect, it's like super good. The sequel is like decent. And then it just plummets down in terms of quality. I yeah. think there was one spike, like one of the movies was kind of decent, like the fourth or fifth one, but then it just immediately went back down in terms of quality. They were just a cash cow. They were whip, like thrown out the door every other year just to keep it relevant and more money. Don't watch the, don't stop after three, after three. It's just, Oh, really keep stopping eight. <laughs> That's real fine. It's like the resurgence. It's like, <laughs> yeah. Land for her time. Dinosaurs take Manhattan. Three lands, also, I don't know if it really time. heats up as something that we want in the dinosaur movie. <laughs> the Comet. So Explosion. yeah, I, I, I don't entirely remember all of that movie. I just remember I don't either. It. And I, put it I remember number it three. being impactful. I just, I dinosaurs, I had to give it to it. Dinosaurs. Well, go watch We're Back, A Dinosaur Tale, or A Dinosaur Story. And then Tammy and the T-Rex. And then the one with <laughs> Whoopi Goldberg and the, her like partner. Oh, God. What was... <laughs> I just remember the cover of that. That's a, Yeah, that's another blockbuster cover. Was it cover. like Ralph or something? I don't know. Oh, that's going to drive me crazy. There's a lot of dinosaur movies. Oh, Theodore Rex, that's it. Yeah. That's the one, yeah. <laughs> In the early 90s, even before Jurassic Park. Yeah. There were a lot. That's why when Jurassic Park finally hit, the children in us were ecstatic because just it was like, they knew, and it was just building up to that point where it's like, boom, here's the last dinosaur movie you'll ever need. It's true. Even to this day, Jurassic Park is the, stands up as the dinosaur movie. Yep. And Dinosaurs stands up as the dinosaur show. Uh, Yeah, after Camp Cretaceous, I will agree. It's still the dinosaur show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if that's the case, then that is The Land Before Time. I can go next. This way you can round out the, the episode last, Nick, if you'd like. Yeah, Nick's number one. <laughs> so my number three, uh, I believe it was supposed to have been released in 1998, but I see a listing for some reason that it was released in Japan in 99, and then it hit theaters for a limited release in 2001 in the US. It is an anime film called Spriggan. They were looking. For a sign. What they found was a warning. Some discoveries should remain buried. It's based on a manga of the same name from 1989, which I never knew that as a kid. I thought it was just like one of those random OVAs that appear out of nowhere into existence. But the story follows this organization called Arkham that tracks down and destroys artifacts so they don't fall into the wrong hands. And they track down Noah's Ark, but another group led by a psychic kid named uh, Colonel McDougal elbows in on it with his two like cyborg team fat man and little boy uh who have like this mini gun and the other guy has like these little piano wires that slice and dice people i just remember them running around in the movie arkham calls in their spriggans which are essentially the super agents and each country has one uh i think in the the movie they only bring in two of them japan spriggan you omanai and francis spriggan jean-jacques mondo but I guess in the actual manga, there's like four that they mention. There's another British one. But it's just this really cool idea of the organization having country-specific agents. As if like, if James Bond had the Japan's James Bond, England's James Bond, United States James Bond, and all of them work as a team kind of deal. It's just very kind of like a, a cool concept there. Jeffrey Wright is United States James Bond, right? 
Uh, Jeffrey Wright or Jeffrey Rush? Uh, right. Just in the new Bond movies. Oh, is he? I haven't seen the new ones. So it, Ar- Noah's Ark is a uh, relic that is like powerful? Yeah, it's an artifact. Um, I, in the movie, it's it... not like the actual full ship, if I recall. Okay. It, it's just like a, it's called Noah's Ark, but it's like this ancient artifact. Gotcha. Whoever <laughs> drives this ship has unlimited power. <laughs> just drop the doors on it and unleash uh, two of everything. The animals are still there. It's preserved in the ice. <laughs> No, just skeletons. <laughs> but um, yeah, so like, when, I, I love. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, when did you see like this was a childhood, like a young yeah. Young so kind like, of thing? I don't remember how I found it exactly. I just remember being excited tracking it down at like an Fye or a block or a Best Buy on DVD in like the early two thousands. I think the the trailer might have played at the beginning of like a uh, Bubblegum Crisis or Generator Gold DVD. Because this was during like that magic time of childhood where my brother and I were big into anime and we're constantly just consuming anything that we can find, including uh, this channel that we got uh, for a while called the Action Channel that used to just have random anime movies and shows on scattered throughout the day in addition to other like 80s action movies. Um, So it would just pop up here and there. But I think that led us to buying one of the DVDs, which then led me to finding the trailer, which then led me to that. Oh, so this came out in 98. Okay. Yeah. So it's old, but not too old. Yeah. I don't know. I guess but that's the, kind of old now. <laughs> 1998. Which, this was during that great time before they really started um, making apparent that they were using like CGI in animated things. So this was all this really smooth, fluid action scenes and like all of these like sweeping car chases and things like that. Because it really has like Indiana Jones vibes. Between the whole um, finding the artifacts thing of the whole like the top men uh, kind of discussion. But it has like the Indiana Jones vibes from the adventure throughout the movie. Because uh, I think they go through like Istanbul and there's this whole fight in the cars. And then there's like the running through the city as they're fighting. Um, and then they there's a lot of like uh, Akira vibes from this kid McDougal who has just like this baseball hat and he has psychic powers. So, I mean, that's very like the whole Tetsuo thing. But actually, so like we we had on previous episodes, in f- researching all of my uh, stuff f- to put this on my list, I found out that Netflix, I guess, is doing a series for Spriggan, and it's going to be coming out later this year. And I watched the teaser, and it looks awesome. So I am very excited to be a, a kid again, waiting for more Spriggan. Yeah, that was my next question, because I, when I Googled Spriggan, the first thing that came up was the Netflix thing, and I was like, oh. Yeah, the two the one teaser is just kind of like a a little dull, and then just a cool beat drop at the end of it. But then the second teaser actually shows some of like the action from the show uh, that looks pretty good. So. I'm I dig it. I'm going to check it out. But for anybody else that just kind of likes the the 90s anime, anybody that just likes a good action animated film, it's definitely worth checking out. The only thing that it does kind of suck is the fact that it's not available digitally anywhere that I've been trying to find. And the DVDs are out of print. So it's like a hundred dollars for the DVD. So I have to locate my copy that's still on our shelf down at my parents house in connecticut next time i go home to visit because i'm not paying a hundred bucks for this movie I, yeah i wouldn't that's if uh, it does well on netflix though hopefully maybe they'll either do a re-release because of the the buzz around it or they might try to get streaming rights to pop it up somewhere yeah if you get a blu-ray of it that'd be cool yeah is that a theatrical release in japan and then just came worldwide or Uh, I'm unsure. I assume it would have been a theatrical release. A lot of these during that time also were OVAs. So essentially, it's just like original video animation, I think. So it would be things that weren't shown in theaters or TV. They were made specifically to just be released as like um, essentially like a straight to DVD thing. But just like a they put in all of that quality. It's just the intent from day one is this is going to be released as a DVD. Right. Um, I don't remember if that's exactly the case. 
anime is tough because a lot of the times I feel like it's a one and done and that's it. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of like movies and things that'll pop up like that. Like uh, I forget some of the the ones like Black Magic M66 or uh, was it X the movie or things like that. But it's a lot of one and done kind of deals based on the manga. Nowadays, also, there's a lot of things that because it gets popular, you end up with a bunch of offshoots and a bunch of side series and then it spawns its own show and. Or like the fact that Gundam has just been going hard since like, I don't know, the 70s. And now there's just like hundreds of different uh, shows and side stories and movies and side movies. That's whatever. Also fun, but it's kind of tough if you're trying to get into it. So Spriggan is just kind of like a one and done movie. And hopefully the series um, starts from the beginning and then runs through that arc and then continues on. I always wanted to watch Dragon Ball Z, but that's the reason I never did. was just I didn't know where the hell to start. So DBZ, they did a, like, an, well, they did DBZ abridged, which is also very funny if you watched DBZ. You, Namekian, too strong, explain now! He fused with Kami so he could become stronger. The f***'s the Kami? Basically, God. But I'm still here! Do you really believe your own hype that much? But they, officially, they did, I think, uh, Dragon Ball Kai, which was like a... Not a director's cut, but it was essentially a shortened version of the series where they just trimmed out all of the filler episodes, trimmed out any of the filler items. They redid some of the animation. They touched up sound and things like that. Well, I don't so mean it's... so much. I don't mean so much now because now it's just a quick Google search, and you know I can find the exact version I need, and so on and so forth. I meant more so like as a kid, because even as uh, a kid. DBZ came out in like the mid 80s, but it didn't pick up steam until like the early to mid 90s here. So by that point, they already had like hundreds of episodes published and finished. So I think they already had like two or three different shows of Dragon Ball. And at that point, like I didn't know where I could watch it. How would I watch it? But all my friends at school were, you know, trying to become Super Saiyan in the bathroom and shit, you know, just making all the noises and poses and shit. And I always wanted to watch the show, and it's just like, oh, that's cool. Vegeta, that guy's awesome. Piccolo, yeah, I can get behind this. But I had no idea where to go. Because I think the the big problem we had back then uh, was the fact that you can't just stream anything you want whenever you want. So it's, I found Dragon Ball Z. I think my brother and I just, we used to watch Toonami that came on Cartoon Network, that like block of Japanese anime. And it was a case of, That show was just on. It was like three quarters into the entire DBZ series during like the Cell games. We just ended up watching an episode and being like, oh, that's kind of cool. And then we just got into it. And once it finished all of the current dubbed episodes that were released, Toonami started back from the beginning of DBZ and then would just go through again until they get up to the end of what's dubbed and then go back through again. So it's like it took us a while to see it all because we had to watch it based solely on when it played on TV. But yeah, like it's unless you have, it's a lot easier nowadays, but yeah, back then you just had to kind of cars going by, just jump on. When you first see Vegeta uh, powering up in, in when it aired in America, he was just finishing powering up in Japan in the original release. It's true. (laughs) Never thought of it that way. That's, that's a hundred percent true. (laughs) <laughs> it still blows my mind that there's some like DBZ movies that got released in like 2010 or like 2008 and then see that they were released in Japan in theaters during some of our screen refresh episodes of like 1989, 1991, um, that it's just that long a gap until all of that floats over. But I'm, I'm glad it did. So that's Dragon Ball Z. No. So that's Spriggan. Spriggan, oh, quick, do you watch generally, or maybe at the time, or has it changed? Do you, are you subtitled, or are you dubbed, like, do you... Oh, the old subs versus dubs? Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, I'm not a strong voice on either side. Granted, like, I prefer, like, if it's available, I'll watch the, the sub, certainly. If it's something I want to turn on in the background while I'm doing other things, because it's a show I like and I've seen before, like, yeah, I'll throw on the dub. Also, there's a lot of dubs that I feel do a really good job, like namely Cowboy Bebop. It's a case of, yeah, like 
Stephen Bloom is amazing as Spike, so I will definitely always watch the dub over the sub. But like, I I'm not going to get offended if anybody's like, oh, I only watch dubs or if anybody's like, oh, I only watch subs. The important thing is that somebody's watching it and enjoying it. So I just kind of drift between either whatever is available. A coworker of mine tried to get me into Jujutsu Kaisen, the new big one that's that's come out. That the only I reason watch. I I really stopped was because it wasn't dubbed. And having to watch the subtitles, I can't, that, that means that I have to fully pay attention to what's going on at the screen at all times. If yeah. I look away for one second, it's gone. Like, and then all the context is lost afterward because you could always miss an important line. And because of that, my willingness to watch it as much really kind of waned. And come like the fourth or fifth episode, I ended up stop watching. It's a good show. I can see why it's so popular now, but it just if like Tim said, if if it's gonna be background noise, sure, whatever, you know, I'll peek over and look. But if I'm gonna be actually having to watch it, the sub is definitely necessary. Yeah. The reason I haven't gotten into anime is because I've been learning Japanese and I'm just waiting until I can just fluently understand what they're saying. That's the best part. Hey, you'll be perfect for video games too. Then you can dub. Yeah. You don't have to wait for stuff to get over here. You just import import games. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be your new uh side hustle. you you'll import and then personally dub all the lines for <laughs> all these properties. By the time I release on the pulse, already out. it is the pulse. <laughs> <laughs> get to work on that. So yeah, so that's Spriggan. Check it out. Definitely fun. And uh, check out these series. That way I can get more Spriggan if it does well. Spriggan! Really just Spriggan, using us Spriggan, as an outlet so that he can talk anime. It's true. I I have no one to talk anime. It's uh, my brother or uh, our friend David, who was on our one of our episodes. They were my uh, anime contacts. So reach out to me. We'll chat anime. Go to anime.com slash discussion and... I'm sure there's lots of people there ready to talk. I don't know if that's a thing. <laughs> oh, it is. I would Google it, it under a safe search first <laughs> just to make sure. I don't Google I'm feeling lucky anything. So, Nicholas, number three. Disney's Robin Hood. From Walt Disney Home Video comes the summer's best Robin Hood adventure with America's most popular hero. It's Robin Hood I want. Walt Disney's Robin Hood. Oh, he's so handsome. He's the cutest and foxiest Robin Hood ever. And kids got class. This summer, give your family an adventure they'll never forget. Walt Disney's Robin Hood on video cassette. Oh, shit. Now that song's going to be stuck in my head. That's that's always been in mine. Yeah. So that's that's so... I didn't realize how old it was. It came out in the 70s. Like early 70s, too. Um, I don't really know how else to describe the movie. It's just... The story Robin of Robin Hood, but <laughs> it's um all anthropomorphic animals. So Robin Hood's a fox. Um Sheriff of Nottingham is a wolf. Um Little John is a bear. And it's just the story of Robin Hood. It's pretty unoriginal. Um but I grew up <laughs> with it as a kid, you know. Um un- 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 not meaning in a demeaning way unoriginal, but just like there it <laughs> It does have its few redeeming qualities. Like, I don't remember um, Sir Hiss. I don't remember there being a normal version of that in, uh, like, the Kevin Costner version, at least the one that comes to mind when I think of Robin Hood that's not <laughs> a fox. But, um, no, the, the, I grew up with the movie. Um, watched it a ton as a kid, especially in, like, the early years. I recently saw, found that it was on Blu-ray. I picked that up, and it was cool to watch almost jarring to watch now because they cleaned it all up so a lot of the animation lines are no longer there and they try to keep it as clean as possible but it's a little weird to see but all the rest of it is still fun and enjoyable and that intro song is like a huge meme nowadays and no one realizes that that's i think the earliest instance where it's ever come from like i think it's called the hamster dance now Oh, because the one that comes to mind for me is the Robin Hood and Little John walking through the forest. It's the same song. Oh, it is. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it's sped up. Like the actual song. <laughs> like Anamanaguchi sped up or? I don't know what that means. It's a, like an 8-bit electro pop band. 
There's oh a lot yeah, of video game right. music. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm aware of them. Yeah. I'm just picturing like a 300 BPM Robin Hood and Little John, give or take. But yeah, like I, I think that was the movie that they had like a comparison of Disney reused certain animation cells and just like went over the animation with the other movie. Um, I forgot what the other one was, but one stole like a dance scene from Robin Hood or Robin Hood stole a dance scene from another Disney movie just for them to reuse. Yeah, they've done it several times. I think Sword in the Stone had one. My Disney trivia has been lacking lately, but yeah. I'm actually Which, secretly like, a Disney person not realizing it. Like, I think it dawned on me a couple months ago, like, wow, I'm almost like one of those Disney people, but I'm not quite there, but I'm really close. I like how if we listen to all these episodes from the beginning, we'll find that screen refresh is just a journey of self-discovery by you. <laughs> seen as you're like, I never thought I liked horror. Then I sat down and realized, yeah, a lot of my things are horror. Yeah, I never realized I was a Disney guy. I looked it up. Created in 1998 by Canadian art student Deidre LeCarte as a GeoCities page, the hamster dance features rows of animated, animated gifs of hamsters and other rodents dancing to various ways in a sped up sample from the song Whistle Stop. <laughs> Written and performed by Roger Miller for the 1973 Walt Disney Productions film, Robin Hood. Here we go. And the true test is if I play a clip of this and we get shut down. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, yeah, with all the Disney we're going to be discussing on this episode, I feel like this is the one that I'm going to be sweating releasing if I use any clips. On the next wonderful world of Disney. See y'all real soon. Sir, uh, Sir Hiss, a snake, and Little John are just straight rips of Baloo and Ka, right? From the Jungle Book? Yes. <laughs> that never crossed my mind. Yeah. <laughs> It's interesting because they're the only two, and it's it's like it's it's not. I don't it's, think it's pretty um, obvious. I don't think. Uh, what's oh, the vultures the make up an appearance too. The 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 Beatles style vultures. I don't know if they're English in this one, but or what's his name? Is it the prince or is the 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 cowardly lion? I prince don't think John. that's yeah. Yeah, I don't think that's uh, Shere Khan or anyone. No, from he's the, he's original. Yeah, he gives. There's slight. Um, Bagheera vibes, but not really. He's, yeah. he's kind of thin and he's like gangly. So, but I, I, I like to think of it not that they reused characters. It's that these are all Disney actors that are now playing different <laughs> roles over the years. It's kind of amazing Baloo was idea. so popular though that I'm pretty sure that's why they brought him back. Yeah, so I think it's even the same actor, which would make sense because it's like if it's kids love it, if it's popular, like just. It's not like they're literally reusing it in terms of they're having him do all the same stuff. Like, just playing a character. Nobody complains when uh, any other actor shows up in multiple movies. Well, it depends on the actor, I guess. <laughs> How dare you, Gary Oldman, do more than one movie? <laughs> He's just playing Baloo again. And every time he <laughs> just conceals himself better, it's getting harder and harder to spot him. I'm still a mystery to you. <laughs> So yeah, Robin Hood, the the Disney film. That's solid. Let's continue the Disney train. Choo choo. The it. Disney le- train is leaving the station. At the, the at Thomas the Tank Engine movie. <laughs> Wait, he wasn't Disney, was he? No, he was invented a kid. by communists. <laughs> who, who, who hired Ringo Starr? Ring, Ringo Starr Tom, was a secret communist. Thomas the Tank Engine was a communist. Uh, <laughs> He's very the, Soviet. He's so industrial. <laughs> the wheels of the tank engine are oiled with the blood of the worker. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at the wheels, like in the middle, it's actually the hammer and a sickle. Uh, it's kind of the point where I can't tell what things are true and what things you're joking about. <laughs> it's for the listener to decide. No, this is another Soviet-inspired movie. Disney's Aladdin, 1992. 
From Walt Disney Pictures, when Aladdin rubbed the magic lamp. I'm your master? And wrong. He unleashed a genie who's polite. What do you need? What do you need? What do you need? Who's helpful? The exits are here, 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 here. Anywhere. Who's eager to please? Oh, no way! <laughs> Aladdin's every wish is his command. Don't miss Walt Disney Pictures' all new Aladdin. Where'd you dig this for so up? Ah! Rated G. Now playing at a theater near you. Check newspaper for showtimes. And you play, play Arabian Aladdin. Nights there. Arabian hey, don't forget to say hi to all my pals when you see them. <laughs> Wait, what? That cursed Aladdin. <laughs> cursed Aladdin. <laughs> that red little boy. That socialist hero, Aladdin. Um, he became the 1%. <laughs> I mean, Aladdin yeah. just proves that... Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Aladdin pulled himself up by the bootstraps, and he's a prince now. He, um, um, he was barefoot through the whole movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get three wishes. I wish for shoes. Pulled himself up by the slipper handles? Uh, yeah, Aladdin, actually. 1992's Aladdin. Hot off Powerhouse the heels film. of The Little Mermaid, I think. I think that was the one. Because, what, well, Little Mermaid was, was 89? Or no, uh, I'm sorry. Was it Beauty and the Beast, maybe? Was between this and, uh, yeah, Beauty oh. and the Beast was it was Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin. Huh. I'm pretty sure. All right, we're all gonna fight. Let's fight. Let's fight on release dates. Google will solve this. Just remember, <laughs> listeners, we do zero fact checking before the episode. So unless we give a specific date and it's a hundred percent convincing, we are just going by the seat of our pants. <laughs> Except Tim, he actually does do the research. I'm right. Yes, Little Mermaid was ninety nine it was eighty nine. And then Beauty and the Beast was ninety one and then Aladdin came out. The next year. Oh, you Aladdin skipped over the, the, the rescuers down under though? Oh uh, well, I mean was that a theatrical movie? Yeah, I thought so. I guess that so. is not considered. Well there's part the rescuers, the... then there's the rescuers down under. That is not part of the Disney Renaissance. Because I think <laughs> it's the two writers. Um well that's what it's actually called. Um I right. think there's two specific writers that did every single movie. And it was just every time they did something, it was just gold, 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 gold Jerry. So this is directed by, yeah, the, well, I don't think these guys were the Renaissance dudes, but they did have a great track record. So it was directed and written by partners, um, writing partners. I don't think partners in life, but uh, Ron Clements and John Musker, they did The Little Mermaid, wrote and directed. They did this, Aladdin. They did The Great Mouse Detective, Hercules, and Treasure Planet, and then a bunch of other kind of credits. And then later on, there's Moana. They actually did Moana recently. That's a gap. Yeah, they finally... I mean, their credits... Can you explain this gap in your resume? <laughs> they had other stuff they were doing, but as far as the big releases, that's just I was looking at. Um, Moana, like, they made the jump to 3D. I think music was Alan Menken. Sure. For that. Because I think the, I'm pretty sure that's right, because the, there was a short-lived musical show called Gallivant that lasted like two seasons, but it, um, the whole thing was like, oh, music by Disney's Alan Menken. And it, it sounds a lot like all of those early 90s Disney things, except just written for a more tongue-in-cheek older crowd. If I sing you the song, will you shut up? Way back in days of old, there was a legend... Oh, do it for real! ...about a hero known as Gala. Sorry to interrupt, it's a very catchy tune and all that. It's a real earworm. Yeah, totally get stuck in your head. But there's only so many times you can hear it. Right. No, I said I said corrected. The Rescuers Down Under is part of the Renaissance, but... Um, <gasps> that one and... Well, that's by Rotten Tomatoes score. But it just didn't do nearly the same success compared to everything else that had come out. The Little Mermaid it like struck big at uh two hundred eleven million dollars. And I'm rounding, but wow, yeah, two hundred and eleven million dollars. On the dot. And then <laughs> Rescuers Down Under did forty seven million. And then Beauty and the Beast did four hundred forty three million. <laughs> and then yeah. it just keeps going up. So yeah, that's the only reason why I didn't think it was. I've I've only ever seen that movie once, and we were camping with my family, and the campground we were at had a kids' night where they had like a projector screen where they played a movie, and it was The Rescuers Down Under. These the are only not experience I have. Joanna eggs. 
I did like that movie though. I think I had probably just the the white case VHS of the Rescuers Down Under. I watched that. I don't remember too much from it, but that was definitely a childhood pastime movie. Aladdin. Aladdin himself. I'm not going to explain Aladdin because you know anybody listening to this knows what Aladdin is. Um, Aladdin was voiced by Steve Wanger, aka Steve Hale, on Full House. That was his like oh. other. He, that was his other big claim to fame. Other than this movie, I believe he was on Full House for like, and then he did this movie. I think I forget yeah. how old Full House. He was. is, he is still the voice of Aladdin as well. I'll keep doing it mm-hmm. every time they bring drag Aladdin out of the vault. <laughs> Aladdin, a lot, of, it's a lot of the actors will continue to reprise their roles too. Yeah, um, I'm just picturing Goro. <laughs> it's time. <laughs> is it time? He's just pounding money out of people. <laughs> <laughs> no my wallet I left. <laughs> Jonathan Freeman just going on what Nick said Jonathan Freeman as Jafar reprised Jafar throughout all the you know movies that came up and he also I think is maybe the first maybe the only person to he played his role on stage in the Broadway adaptation of Jafar he played Jafar on stage as oh well. I didn't know that yeah, it, it's a good stage show. The musical, yeah, I, I mean, I the, saw it actually. Yeah, yeah, the musical's better than that live action movie they tried to do. <laughs> right. Yeah, definitely. Um, I should we see saw that. like I that. Want to see that? We saw the genie. I think the genie ended up winning a Tony for that yeah. play. He was he was great. He and Jonathan Freeman were both in the show still when we saw it, so that was cool. We were just surrounded by children. I guess that's to be expected. That was the only downside of seeing the show. Like a matinee, probably. It was like, oh, too many kids here. Um, at this kid You're show. too young to appreciate Broadway. <laughs> yeah, your mom paid 250 bucks for you to sit here, and you're just not even paying attention. Eating boogers. Eating boogers. And a $250 um, box seat. <laughs> um, Frank Welker as... Okay, guess who Frank Welker plays? Just take the a guess. The Cave of Wonders. No. That'd be really? my, oh, that would have that would have been Kevin Michael Richardson, if monkey. anybody. Yes, he's a boo. A boo. <laughs> a boo? That's Frank Welker. Not a surprise. Cha ching. Linda Larkin as Jasmine. I don't know. She didn't seem like she had I mean she had an extensive career acting and voice acting, but I, nothing like super jumped out at me that was beyond Aladdin or like as big as Aladdin. And uh, Rob Williams plays uh, the genie. Um, moving on. Uh, it's probably <laughs> one of the... I mean, he's, Robin Williams, obviously, there's, you can say five movies that are iconic, but this one definitely, I think, fits, fits in there with iconic Robin Williams roles. Because probably he's for just a lot like of kids, so this was their first introduction to Robin Williams. They didn't watch Mork and Mindy? Or... <laughs> <laughs> Nobody was uh, checking out Good Morning Vietnam as a child? He had a big fallout with Disney because of this movie. Yeah, I have because that. Because he knew... I have some tidbits. He knew exactly the kind of crowd he, Aladdin would draw if his name was attached to it. Socialist. So he said specifically, look, I know I'm a big name. Please don't put me like front and center on the poster because this is just... I'm." He he wanted to treat it like it's a smaller thing. He didn't want to take the full attention away from the rest of the movie. So Disney's like, of course, you know, absolutely, we'll definitely do that. They didn't. And uh, they went against all of his wishes when it comes to the merchandising and the advertisement behind the movie itself. He was absolutely furious, and that's why he does not reprise his role as Genie in the sequel. The Return yeah. of Jafar. Although, doesn't he come back for, uh, was it 40 Thieves? He does. Appar- apparently, so Michael Eisner, the CEO at the time, tried, to, I, supposedly, I'm I, again, I'm going off, yeah. He slapped him <laughs> with a, a glove and said, meet me in the field of battle. We're sorry. Um, <laughs> Prepare your champion. It's time. <laughs> he tried to. Uh, gift him an original Pablo Picasso painting, and that didn't work. Uh, <laughs> Who'd have thought? <laughs> um, the only, th- I guess, what happened later was I think Jeffrey Katzenberg was the um, chairman of Disney, not the CEO, but the chairman. And 
I guess once he was fired, like Robin Williams was like, okay, this is fine. I guess maybe he was responsible for going back on uh, the agreements that were made about marketing. Um, and then, so, uh, yeah. And the new chairman like apologized and like, I guess Robin was like cool with it. And then he came back for, uh, the Prince, of, uh, Aladdin, and the Prince of Thieves, the direct to video sequel to be genie again. Which for a direct to video sequel, I remember having a lot of the fun with that movie. It's actually one of the yeah, best sequel it is. movies there are. Yeah. That could have been like a theatrical sequel, I think. I mean, it's weird to say this, but like I think the budget and like just the scope of it kind of shows maybe from what I remember, like that it's a direct to video, but could have been zhuzhed up and and like definitely the story could have been a, a sequel, I think. I I didn't know that Dan Castellanata, Homer Simpson, was Genie in the second movie. I did not know Makes that. Makes sense. I didn't know that either. And apparently he had done a whole recording session for the third movie, and then once Robin was like, I'm back, like they just replaced him with <laughs> Robin just... Williams. Yeah. <laughs> Who, this file yeah. is too big for the trash can. Would you like to permanently <laughs> delete it? Yes. <laughs> Who voiced Genie in the show? I think I think Dan. I, I could be wrong. I don't know. I was looking at it before the we started recording. Frank but. Welker. <laughs> it was probably Dan if they um yeah. had him do the second movie. Which again, another powerhouse uh <laughs> voice actor in terms of number of things. But I, I Maybe guess Maybe Homer, I'll always remember was grandpa on Hey Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> like this movie as a kid, like I think just it was Robin Williams probably had a little bit of an impact just with his just manic craziness and like he wasn't really funny with all the imp- I, didn't, I didn't understand all the impersonations i think lots of those like adults probably got a kick out of like probably most of them um the one yeah, i, I always one of them was like ed sullivan <laughs> yeah. thank you for the show um <laughs> the really quick one that's just i always think about is <laughs> he's playing chess with the uh, magic carpet and he's like uh, the carpet makes a a move, and he's he, he's like, "Oh, that's a good move," and like he just does Rodney Dangerfield. He's like, "I can't believe it! I'm losing to a rug." Like it's just, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that always gets me. I would but, love um, to see the amount, like with his improv, the amount of things on the cutting room floor. Not because it's like, "Oh, we got to delete this," but just in general, like there has to be so many other takes of other jokes he just threw out there. I. I pull, I know how we feel about IMDb trivia, but I pulled the specifically those things you're talking about. Apparently, he improvised so much that there was about 16 hours of material. <laughs> <laughs> I would have. I mean, I don't I don't know the source of it, but yeah, I'm not surprised. Come on, Disney, put that in your take that out of the vault. Come on, you cowards! <laughs> I oh, guess I'm sure the, a lot of it is probably like X-rated too. Give yes. Me the, the 17 and a half hour Aladdin Robin Williams cut. Yeah, apparently, yeah, I don't know the sources on these, but they're too like specific to be like, why would you make this up? Um, the opening scene, he voices that merchant on the opening scene in the movie. Apparently, it was unscripted. He was brought to a soundstage and asked to stand behind a table that had a couple objects on it, and uh, they were covered with a bed sheet, so they pulled the sheet back, and without looking, just like he just starts talking about it in character. And much of that was like not appropriate for the movie. <laughs> Just like Which when I, I hear would love all to that see stuff. if that was shot chrono- or like recorded chronologically. So that would be the dead beginning of the movie and be like, <laughs> okay, Robin, start. We can't use any of this first stuff. <laughs> oh, God, we have another week. Apparently, he ad libbed so much that they couldn't submit the script for like adapted screenplay or something. I don't. I don't know how to be adapted because I got oh I guess because it's adapted from an old story the old story but yeah it, it, it they couldn't submit it because it was the much of the writer's stuff for him was like not in the movie to the point where he gets a uh, screenwriter credit <laughs> <laughs> yeah he probably could have um the a last really good a, arbitration letter the last little interesting tidbit was apparently Patrick Stewart had to turn down Jafar because of the next generation conflict scheduling and he said he regretted it. But I can't imagine it's it's hard to imagine him as Jafar because the guy Freeman did such a good job. 
So it's like That's weird true. to imagine. I think he probably would have done a good job, but it's like I can't imagine him as Jafar after the one we got. Alternate universe kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. But um same universe where uh, Nick Cage became Superman and Right. Marlon Wayans became Robin in the third <laughs> Tim Burton right. Batman movie. Yeah. Let's make all those movies. There's With, actually um, a uh sidebar, a podcast. I think it's the best movies never made that I was recommended from another uh, podcast, but they cover and discuss all of the movies that were originally supposed to be in production or the ones, the original scripts that were done before things kind of like fell into development hell or ended up getting changed. So they talk about that stuff, like the Robin thing. They talk about the Nick Cage thing and what those movies might have looked like. That's cool. Cut that out. We're not, we're not promoting. They didn't pay us. No, they did. Um, it's in my demo. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Hey, we expect two thirds of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you if you've never heard of Aladdin, it's a it's, it's a great movie. Yeah, it still stands up. It's still super entertaining. Like, to, it's it's a great. It's one of their one of their best top three of the two D era. That's not a hot take, I don't think. Yeah, no, a hot it, take. Were you to say if the newest one was better than the original? <laughs> That's a hot take. The live action Aladdin fixes the problems that were set in the original. <laughs> Namely, that it was too animated. Jafar was too evil in the original. It didn't have a really radio friendly pop song during a slow mo version in the middle of it. <laughs> so, Aladdin. Aladdin. <laughs> uh, I, I forget. Is that back to me? Okay, yes. number two. Number so, two. Another film that I saw as a a wee a wee tot from the popular Studio Ghibli or Studio Ghibli from Hayao Miyazaki it is Spirited Away. Walt Disney Studios presents a Studio Ghibli film. Honey, don't take a shortcut. You always get us lost. From master filmmaker Hayao Miyazaki. What is it? Come on, let's go in. I want to see what's on the other side. Be here. Get out of here now. What? Leave before it gets dark. You've got to get across the river. Go. I'll distract them. This fall, prepare to be spirited away. I almost put his movies on my list. I hadn't seen them enough, but they're great. They're so good. But uh, directed and written by Hayao Miyazaki, the amazing sound like the the score is terrific in this movie i guess it's uh was it uh joe hisaishi was the the guy who did the music but i guess he became friends early on after doing it i think it was like nossing in the valley of the wind or something and and then paired up with hiro miyazaki kind of like how john williams and like spielberg or was it john williams and george lucas worked together multiple times over the years this was the same case but overall like it, it it's an absolute classic it's a movie I try to watch every so often, and I had the pleasure of catching at a theater during a work trip uh, a couple years ago where they were doing a special screening where one night was the dub, the next night was the sub. And after I finished up at work, I drove to the next town over to catch the movie both times just to see the two versions in theaters. It's one of those things that I had on like my bucket list for films in a theater. But overall, so it follows the a little girl, uh, Chihiro, Moving to a new home with her parents, they stop to check out like this abandoned fairground of sorts. And long story short, the village blends into this realm of fantasy as the parents are turned into pigs and the little girl has to escape and find a way to survive and get them back. Uh, She ends up trying to work at this bathhouse run by a witch, Yubaba, that has her parents captive as she's trying to devise this way to fix everything and get it back to normal there. So it's it's a great movie for kids, a little bit. Not like young, young, because there's a bunch of fantasy elements in it that are fun. But I think for them to kind of grasp the the overall story and whatnot, it's a lot of fun fairy tale elements that might be more for like a, not a teenager, but like a preteen age, maybe like uh, 10 to 12 kind of deal. But I'm pretty sure this was a purchase my parents made when we were younger because they knew we were into anime. It sounded interesting to them. They bought the DVD and then we sat around the kitchen table at my grandparents' house when we were visiting them in, uh, down in Pennsylvania ages ago 
and we watched it as a family sitting around the kitchen table, and that is still my favorite viewing of this film. And also it acts as kind of this great gateway into Studio Ghibli to try to get other people to appreciate Miyazaki or just get into what Japanese animation has to offer. Check this out. Go give Castle in the Sky a chance. Go check out Howl's Moving Castle. Uh, or if for a slightly older fare, maybe check out like Princess Mononoke or The Wind Rises. But it's just a lot of great things. I, I think of them as kind of the uh, Japanese counterpart to what Disney was doing on a lot of these things. So it's just releasing a bunch of really great fantasy element films over the years. I always felt they were all original pieces, too. If they were based on anything, I never knew about it. With Disney, it's all based on previous stories. I mean, Aladdin, King Arthur, even Frozen is based off of like an old fairy tale. Yeah, I think like a Hans Christian Andersen deal. Yeah, the Miyazaki films, those are all out of left field. I don't know any kind of source material for those, but it's always so enchanting to watch and the world building that he's able to portray. And, you know, he's a brilliant storyteller and he knows exactly when to tell, when to show, and always a great view. It's so many little simple things throughout his movies, even like, especially Spirited Away, that just capture such a great feeling to it like there has to be no dialogue it's just the music playing as you're watching wind blow through grass in a field kind of deal but the way they animate it the way the music kicks in like all of it just ends up creating such a great scene that it's terrific and his eye for food Uh. gives Tolkien (laughs) a run for his money because the food in that sets unrealistic expectations for every time I get ramen now because that's what yeah. I'm expecting whenever I eat. Even something as simple as like in Howl's Moving Castle, I think she just makes like fried eggs and bacon. It don't look like that in real life. I want it to look like how <laughs> she made it. Yeah, I think what? there's like whole um, articles and things like that on all the, the Studio Ghibli or Studio Ghibli recipes and all of their food and whatnot. Because it's like the feast the parents have at the beginning of Spared It Away. I don't blame them. I would probably have gone hog wild on it myself so dean you need to watch spirit of the way yes we need to get you into anime yes before we uh dip a toe in before we hold your head under with cowboy bebop i've dipped a toe i know it's not japan you can say speed racer <laughs> <laughs> oh shit i forgot i watched speed racer that counts no just I've, i haven't finished but i've been watching uh castlevania which i know is an american show but seems to be it's probably like in the Pretty close vein to anime. <laughs> Castlevania is in the vein. For Ghibli stuff, I wouldn't even think of it as anime. Just look at them as just brilliant stories. Oh right, just yeah. No, anime. yeah, I yeah, I wouldn't. I guess I wouldn't look at them as anime, really. Which I know we've talked about it on previous. Japan's what Disney. It was. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> or is Disney just uh, America's Studio Ghibli? But the. <laughs> I think this goes back to what we were talking about in a previous episode, how a lot of the kind of standard trappings of when people think of anime isn't going to be present in every single thing that's labeled as anime. Like, granted, yes, you will get your Dragon Ball Zs, you will get like all of that type of stuff, which is fun and good. But then you get these things like Spriggan as far as like an action movie, Spirit Away is just a fun fantasy kids film, like... Uh, Grave of the Fireflies, as far as like a viewing of post World War II kind of deal, like all of these kind of different ideas, different stories. That yes, it is animated. Yes, it is Japanese animation. But I, I feel like it's it presents a stigma that if you can overlook it, there's a lot of great stuff out there. Yeah, that's what I meant by it. don't look at it like anime. Yeah, which I mean, I say stigma, but it's well, like, I, I don't see it as such. It's just a case of like, I know some people look at it as, eh, I like cartoons. I don't like anime. Well, yeah. it's, I don't like all cartoons the same as I don't like all anime, but there's good stuff on both sides. I think I think it's the waifus that have made a bad look for <laughs> Japanese culture. Yeah, I can't stand that whole like, <laughs> ooh, ooh, gamer gamer stuff. Like that literally... <laughs> drives like and like nails on chalkboard kind of reaction to me i fucking loathe it and i don't understand it (laughs) and i i think it's the fear of unknown but it's just not a territory i want to delve into 
And because anime has some of the roots built into that, that's just kind of skews me out. Yeah, there's a lot of things that like you'll watch a show and then it's like fan servicey, and I'm like, I just, just well, I don't mind fan service. Oh, okay, never mind then. Yeah, I mean, uh, Dean, you can agree. I mean, sometimes you just you need to see some things, but tracks there are others land. that huge tracks, <laughs> tracks of land. land. But there are some. I there's a, there is a line sometimes where it's it can be too much. But it's the same goes for like anything. Cause like I didn't like the Halloween movie that came out because I felt his representation of fan service was inappropriate and it detracted from the story. Where then other things that's just the entire embodiment of the show. Like that's you're gonna expect it. Just that's the thing. I don't know. Just cut this whole segment out. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna start the episode. If so I have As to get rid of all of my spirit of the way section. Oh, the whole thing. <laughs> to start over from scratch. So Tim, what's your uh choose new movies? Second pick. Choose my new uh movies. my second pick is Shrek 2. Ah, man of culture. <laughs> so that is Spirited Away. I like the sexual innuendos in Shrek movies. Cause it's for the adults. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make sure we had that awkward silence after that, just to make it seem weirder. <laughs> I but, appreciate that. So, Nick, you're number two. I'm trying to think of a really sexually inappropriate animated movie, but I can't actually think of one off the top of my head. Cool World? Sausage Party. Fritz the Cat? No. Um, the Nightmare Before Christmas. From Touchstone Pictures. <laughs> it was the night before Christmas, but in the land of Halloween... It was decided that this year, something new would be seen. Surprised, aren't you? From Tim Burton, the director of Beetlejuice and Edward Scissorhands, comes a motion picture experience unlike any other. Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas. And what did Santa bring you, honey? Rated PG. Coming this month to a theater near you. That's a good one. That was uh, a good one. I did, I did ask... Um, like what do we consider to be animated and stop motion oh, yeah. is one of them. So for sure. Absolutely. I, um, I went along with it. Um, this was one of those things that helped develop me into the goth that I was during high school. <laughs> and just amazingly enough, the movie is short as hell. It's only like an hour and 10 minutes long. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's extremely short, but it took them forever to make it because it was, you know, fully, stop motion animation from start to finish i think there's only like maybe one or two cgi shots and that was just because they were superimposing like the ghost onto the film or um like in the intro oh with, yeah like the bats and stuff or like animating some flames but the whole, the whole entire movie is see um yeah the entire movie is cgi no the, the entire <laughs> movie is stop motion so it took up a really long time to get all that completed but the world that was created through tim burton that was not directed by Tim Burton. A lot of people think it was. It really wasn't. I was that one of those people was, up until college. Yeah. Um, Nightmare Before Christmas was directed by the same director that eventually did Coraline. And his name is padding for time because I am looking Henry it up. Selznick? Henry Selleck. Oh, Selleck. Yeah. He directed both movies. Tim Burton only had the creative mind in designing all of the different monsters and the story itself. I had the privilege of going to the Tim Burton exhibit at the MoMA in New York City, and you were able to see the actual original drawings that he did, the actual real original drawings. And a couple had a couple of his um movies that he made when he was a kid that was just like more stop motion stuff or just hand drawn animation cells of the stories that he made. And you could see a lot of the progenitors of what eventually would become like Jack Skellington or other elements from the movie, which was insanely cool to see. But the whole world building he did, the story is pretty unique, at least in my eyes, I thought it was. The songs are really awesome. And even to this day, a lot of people are still covering the songs that were from oh, yeah. that movie. So I always and thoroughly it's enjoyed the, it. It's the absolute best level in Kingdom Hearts, or Kingdom Hearts 2, I think. Yeah, that I was looking forward to that one a lot. Yeah, but it's, I think at the, I had the VHS of that, and I think before the movie 
I think it was on there that they had the short Frankenweenie, like his original short before it eventually got made into a movie. Yep. Which I, I love the days of having shorts before films. Still got it at Disney movies. Those days are still here. I was going to say, but who sees Disney movies in theaters? And then I remembered, I've actually seen every Disney movie that's been released for some reason. <laughs> so you saw in Lion theaters. King in theaters? I saw Lion King in theaters. The new Did one. Did I? I don't know. If... Oh, the new one. No, I the animated ones only. Yeah. I saw the lying. Aladdin, or actually I take it back, yeah, I did see Aladdin in theaters, the, the live action one, and I was like, won't get fooled again. <laughs> they could just cut that movie into the parts of Will Smith, surprisingly, though it would make it better. They should take all job. of their live action ones and then just do like a, a Disney Sunday night special of, we're not going to do a bunch of live action films, here's just famous actors doing some of your favorite parts from the animated ones. I think it would be more palatable. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. A lot cheaper too. Yeah. A lot cheaper. I mean, I the the Lion King as bad as it was, I got to give it to John Favreau at the very least because it looks it's an animated movie. It doesn't look like it whatsoever, but it looks all real. Yeah. Although actually, I take it back. I saw the live action Jungle Book. Actually, I think I saw it with you, Dean. Um, but I saw the live action Jungle Book and that one was actually pretty good. I remember liking that one, but it's the same case with Lion King that it was all of the, the CGI animals and whatnot looked great. I forgot I saw the live action Jungle Book. <laughs> so did I. I was sitting here now. thinking like, did I see that with you? And then like, I just remember like Christopher Walken, I think as the orangutan King Louie. Yeah. I was like, okay, I, think, I guess I, guess actually, I did see that. Actually, I'm pretty sure I've seen a lot of Disney films with you and your wife in theaters. <laughs> I think I saw that. I think we watched, uh, was it Zootopia? I think I've seen Moana. So, yeah. I think Tim Burton is doing an Adams Family remake. A to live action? With Rob Zombie's Monsters. I think I have to look that up. Tim Burton. Because they have the... Isn't there an animated one? Or my th- is, is it, It's animated, right? Yeah, there was an animated one that came out, I think, like last okay. year or two years ago. But I mean, I feel like the the Adams Family is a, another property that's prime for a a Tim Burton. It's going to be on anyway. Netflix, and it's going to focus on Wednesday. If they don't release it on a Wednesday, I'll be disappointed. He's going to do letters. it on Tuesday now, just to spite you. <laughs> we riot. John Netflix listens to our podcast, and he's going to release this on a Tuesday. You know what? Fuck that one guy, Tim, on that one podcast. <laughs> but yeah, the um. Nightmare, I was going to say Nightmare on Elm Street. Nightmare Before Christmas, I think, uh, still still holds up. I mean, God, I remember when we were in, what was it, high school, and they just re-released the movie in theaters, and it ended up making a ton of money. It's like, yeah, there no changes that I recall. They just put it back in theaters. Nightmare kind of bothered me a little bit, because Disney was really ashamed of it at first. It is a little outside their comfort zone. It does contain some things that are not in your typical Disney movie. There is blood on the in the thing, and there's some subtle references that just they wouldn't normally do. And they kind of pretended there wasn't much merchandise for a long time. And then they started to realize that they have a cult classic, and they slowly kind of experimented re-releasing more and more stuff. And then that's when I think they fully realized, like, exactly at that point. They re-released it for, I think, maybe like a 10-year anniversary. They released it in theaters, and it made bank. And then they realized, oh, we actually have a hit here. Yeah, and that's Nostalgia now is a hell of a drug. And now you walk around, especially Halloween time, you can't go two feet without stumbling onto something that has like Oogie Boogie on it or Jack yeah. Skellington or anything from that movie. I went yeah, as Jack Skellington, I think the last Halloween I went out. Did I recall really? it vividly because I had this giant Jack Skellington mask that had these like um, black mesh things over the eyes. And I said I couldn't see. So David took his pocket knife out and he held my head and he said, hold still. And he cuts into the eye holes. So I'm just standing there doing, oh, God, no. no. <laughs> he's just cutting into the eye holes. And it worked out great. I can see and I still have both of my eyes. That was the last time I went trick-or-treating. Yep. The last hurrah. I, was, I would have kept trick-or-treating just at that point. Adults were stopping giving me candy. So Yeah, we were a little big. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll keep going if they keep giving me candy. Just have to have better costumes. Or children to get them for me. That's, 
<laughs> Moving it's <all> on. A scam. <laughs> so yeah, Nightmare Before Christmas. Booya. Which brings us to It brings us to the bathroom because I've had too much water. I'll be right back. Number one. This is a movie keeping it Disney. Um, I mean for myself, not yeah. Um, this movie in the middle of the Disney Renaissance, this movie started another renaissance. It was a renaissance upon a renaissance. It was an animation renaissance. The animation being three-dimensional animation. This movie is called Toy Story 1. <laughs> Toy Story 1. Okay, everybody, coast is clear. This holiday season, it's showtime. Turn on your imagination. That's using the old noodle. When toys come to life. Boo, boo, boo. Walt Disney Pictures presents the first ever computer animated feature film. Code Red, we are Code Red. To infinity Boom. and beyond. <laughs> Toy Story, rated G. Oh, Dean, you got a friend in me. <laughs> Randy Newman single-handedly saved Disney after the disastrous Lion King of 1995 the same year. <laughs> um, it, it baffles me sometimes on the people that end up in Disney films or like end up in those animated films of like, oh, we put like Dennis Leary and I think it was like Ice Age. So Randy Newman doing the music for this and I think his popular song for uh, like years earlier was like short people ain't got no reason to live. <laughs> <laughs> that he was like famous for, and then somebody was like, "Put that guy in a Disney movie." I've never heard that before. You know what's worse though? That. I'm trying to it. think. I never heard the song, but I'm trying to take those specific words and replace the lyrics to "You Got a Friend in Me." <laughs> Short people ain't got a reason to live. In his voice, that's 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 funny. Batman with his kids and dog. Drove in through the morning fog. That's uh, that's his Family Guy joke. Um, <laughs> yeah. So Toy Story, little known Toy Story. This is just a fantastic movie. Never okay. heard of it. So my number. Oh. <laughs> uh, John Lasseter. Disney bought or di- yeah, Disney acquired Pixar. I don't know what made them buy them. They just thought this was going to be it. They're moving into 3D animation. But um, uh, George John Lasseter was like... Created Pixar. And oh, then he created it. Yeah, and then he sold the property. Um, I think Disney and Steve Jobs saw it, bought yeah, Steve it Steve Jobs was him. part of Pixar, yeah. And then they realized what they were able to do with it. They experimented. They made that little precursor thing to toy story and then you may continue yeah um i think steve jobs was actually like what have i done like i've made a huge mistake until the movie as as the movie went through production he, i think he like was like okay okay and uh got into it but um john lassiter headed up pixar and uh the creative head and i don't know what his real title was but he um he directed i thought he did a lot more because i know pixar had a a crap load of work but he directed this toy story 2 he gets story credit on three and four but he only directed cars cars 2 and a bug's life that's his only directing credit as far as i could tell but he directed this andrew stanton who who had a career after this he uh, wrote it he uh, co-directed bug's life he directed finding dory and wally and the flop john carter not of mars (laughs) Um, <laughs> apparently um, John Carter of uh, Newark <laughs> much different film it looked like New Jersey I think the <laughs> setting saved a ton on the budget <laughs> uh, so yeah this I, I think I feel like this movie started like the let's get celebrities to be voice actors like as an ensemble cast like that kicked off a craze you know at some point everybody started Everybody, I mean, dreams work, DreamWorks, and like it just became a thing. Like we gotta have like a, a a stellar cast to voice our movie, our animated film. 
I mean, these people weren't huge stars. They were at one point, like, but they're 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 well known. But it was, I mean, obviously Tom Hanks and Tim Allen. But then there's Don Rickles, Jim Varney, Wallace Shawn, John Ratzenberger, Annie Potts, and Arlie Army as the army sergeant, appropriately. A great cast. Oh, I thought great that cast. Was, I thought Arlie Ernie played um, Andy's mom. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, it's time to get to dinner. <laughs> Coming, mom. Get your ass down here or I will shit down your neck. (laughs) Andy, how tall are you? (laughs) I'm four foot. Four foot? I didn't know they stack shit that high. (laughs) While the RB men are just watching, taking notes, like, yep, that's a good one. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so the, the, the voice acting is great. Tom and Tim were great. You know, it's like you can't imagine anybody else playing these iconic, now iconic roles. But it's funny going back and watching clips from this movie. It, and the, I mean, it, the animation is good, but it's like, wow, like the, the leaps and bounds that it is today, like with 3D animation, it's like, it's, it doesn't look bad, but it's like you can tell like the technology and the ability to create 3D animation is like, is crazy nowadays, like with how, photorealistic they can make things um but this was of course revolutionary for the time and you know spawned a whole new or at least it probably wasn't it wasn't the first thing to be 3d animated but it was the most successful and like people realize like this is a whole new way to animate that's gonna make disney money and make people money and just another medium a medium within a medium i guess a style not a medium but it's the first animated movie to be nominated for a Best Screenplay Oscar. And this is actually, in film school, this was like the book that my screenwriting teacher chose to use was, uh, this was the first movie covered in it just because it's so textbook, I guess it's like with, uh, what was called to like the sequence approach to making movies. Like it was perfectly, it was it was like kind of a, it followed a formula, but it like just like... Like by numbers? <laughs> it follows a formula... But it's it, the way it layers in like exposition in the beginning, like you're learning all this stuff, but they're not sitting there telling you like exposition. They're doing things, but it just happens to be like creating this world and like you're learning so much information in that opening scene when they're um well when the opening scene and leading up through when Buzz is introduced, like it's just like I don't know, it's just I think the chapter is called like firing on all eight, which means eight sequences of a movie that you have. I thought you meant like, it is a really great a... script. V8 engine. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also the yeah, but this is just one of my. I guess is yeah, it's my top animated movie. Like it's, I think that's maybe that's it's interesting. I didn't know it was nominated for an Oscar at the time. It was what I don't know, eight or uh, nine or ten in ninety five. Nine, I'd be nine. I didn't care about the Oscars, <laughs> but um, I guess looking back, I was like, well, that's why it's so effective as a movie. It's just very tightly scripted and written and just the performances are like just it's a great movie endlessly rewatchable and i feel like even though animation has come so far since then this movie does not like age poorly like i I can watch toy story and it's still perfectly fine today um as far as i remember actually uh years ago i think my brother had a, a field trip where for some reason they were going to like the theater And you can either see, you sign up for Jumanji, or you can sign up for Toy Story. And my parents were chaperones, so they took me out of class, and I got to go with them. And we all signed up for Jumanji, so I'm I'm really glad I got to see Jumanji in theaters, but I missed out on seeing Toy Story in theaters. Shame. I wake up in a cold sweat every night because of that. (laughs) I saw it twice in theaters. Oh! Oh, so you saw it for me, too. I missed the first five minutes, and I hate doing that when you go to a theater <laughs> so you so immediately will... turned around and walked back out <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I sat and watched the whole thing and I'll then see you in 90 minutes i'd need to uh watch it again to make sure it's just like completionist sake because something like the predator bit where you don't realize that you see the alien ship in the very first like 30 seconds <laughs> right yeah yeah like why are the toys alive they must have explained it in the first five minutes yes so that's why we went back. And I'm glad we did, because there was quite a bit of exposition in the first five minutes. So, Yeah, kind of yeah, get their whole like grouping of the toys and 
how they interact. Because the first playthrough, I thought it was just an extension of Child's Play and just a bunch of fucking serial killers all <laughs> did the, you know, the voodoo trick. And it's just, that's all of them. And then now the that's a great idea. In. Give me the power, I beg of you! <laughs> we did it! We did it! <laughs> yes! <laughs> Actually, yeah, Andy, that works. <laughs> yeah, see? <laughs> Oh man! Oh, is it just I want all, to story the, a... all the split personalities and all the different toys? You do do you guys remember today, there yeah. was another Disney show called Secret Life of Toys that was like live action, but it was all like puppet, like not puppets. It was more like Muppet type things of all the different toys in the kids' room. But the whole thing was the toys are alive when they're not looking. Is that around but Christmas? If they ever. Yeah, they had the Christmas episode with like the new toy that shows up and the oh, new toy thought, is like causing a problem. I thought it was just that. There was a whole series? Yeah, there was a series. Yeah, I thought oh, it was wow, a movie. Oh, wow, because I only remember the Christmas episode, which yeah, me too. is and it's like, like a rabbit, the plot right? of Toy Story. Uh, yeah, I think it was a... Or it was a tiger. Yes, tiger. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, tiger's the main stuff, one. Stuff and like tiger. a mouse. Yeah. And then the, the new toy is like a space lady, or yeah. kind of. Yeah, it's a weird, it's, there's too many parallels to be, like, coincidental. Oh, now, what Christmas means here in the playroom is that we will have new members entering our little community. Oh, the children will be receiving new toys. Toys that will be confused about the ways of the world. What we must do is open our hearts and welcome them just as we did last year and every year before that. The other harsh difference is if a toy gets caught moving when somebody looks at them, they die. <laughs> yeah, or they become, yeah, they're essentially frozen forever. Yeah, they they're become a, a toy. a regular like, toy. Yeah. Yeah, I have that call. So all you kids out there, I if watch your that toys again. don't get up and move around, you may have already killed them. <laughs> Never look at your toys again. Dean, I would, <laughs> not, the want blind your, I would not want your collection coming to life. Because some of the pieces that you have, I would be terrified if they became real. Yeah, what I, I guess Motaro. Yeah. Goro, <laughs> they could be deadly. Scorpion shooting his little sp his spear at me. <laughs> I'm just picturing like a an updated version of Puppet Master, except all of your toys come alive to get you. Oh, I want to watch that. I want to. I guess I could make that, huh? We could always just make a horror version of um, Indian in the Cupboard. <laughs> 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 Write all these down. Like we got to cut this out so nobody takes these ideas. <laughs> fun fact. I'm. I, I like to do. I'm doing. I'm a fun fact guy. Fun, fun fact. fact. More I've fun never facts. Seen Toy Story. Never, never seen it. <laughs> I just, it was number one on the list I Googled, so. <laughs> Mattel, Barbie was originally like the Bo Peep character and had a bigger part in the movie. And Mattel was <laughs> like, this is going to be shit. So they like had to rewrite it. They Mattel pulled Barbie. They had a uh, Reese's Pieces moment. <laughs> <laughs> and a, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. And of course, Barbie makes an appearance in like the later, like the sequel or something. She comes crawling back, looking for that the, paycheck. <laughs> I didn't know this. These are things I learned. Um, the toolbox in Sid's house, when uh, Woody is going looking for Buzz, it's branded Binford Tools huh. from Home Improvement. Obvious connection there. Sid's house has shining carpet in the hallways. I've never noticed that. Yeah, these are just like funny things. Funny things I learned. Tom Hanks recorded his dialogue during breaks of Sleepless in Seattle and A League of Their Own, but he didn't want to record dialogue while he was filming Philadelphia. <laughs> like in between. <laughs> I wonder why. It's like, maybe you shouldn't pull my attention off of this uh, character. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's Wow, Woody gets real depressing towards that last half. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
Uh, that's pretty much it. There's lots of stuff about this movie, but um, no, keep going, keep going. Ratzenberger <laughs> appears in every Pixar movie. John Ratzenberger, he's the good luck charm. He's like I'll, in every Pixar. I'll always movies. remember him as the. I think it was the Yeti with the lemon snow cones and Monsters Inc. <laughs> <laughs> He's the Stan Lee of the uh, Pixar universe now. Um, but yeah, obviously this movie is incredibly impactful and uh, pervasive in pop culture. And uh, it holds a special place with me, obviously, with nostalgia. This movie was made, I think, on the idea of nostalgia and like toys. And uh, obviously I collect. And um, I wouldn't put Toy Story 3 above this movie, but obviously that ending of that movie is impactful. Why I, why I, collect, <laughs> why I collect toys. Well, plus Still, it's like, like just the idea of it. I don't know about you guys, but as a kid growing up, I had a lot of like action figures and whatnot. And it was a case of I would take care of them because for some reason in my head, if it's, oh, if you step on it, it's, oh, I hurt my figure and I would feel bad about it. So for years, I mean, I feel like even now it's I make sure I'm not like just stuffing them into a box. I want to make sure they're taken care of. And I think Toy Story was partially to blame. Or maybe you just want to be killing them. That. You thought they were alive. Yeah. Or maybe you just kind of tapped into that uh, part of my brain that was already there of treat these things responsibly. They you have just had a PTSD like trigger from the ending of that movie. You shove enough oh. of them into boxes poorly, they're gonna spring to life and threaten you with your. your well, yeah, that's how they kill Sid at the end. It's true. <laughs> We see that's a great moment. We see everything. His head look at the three sixty. <laughs> yeah. And then they're gooble gobble, gooble gobble. <laughs> they turn they're, Sid into a toy. They're, they're burning Sid at the stake. <laughs> God, I hated Sid. I mean he was supposed to. It was a great it's a great job. Which means I guess he did a great job as an actor. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, Toy Story. Yeah. Yeah. Tim. So I guess that's it's 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 my turn now. It is. Yeah. Uh my number 1 uh was released in Japan in July of 1989 and came to the US in August of 92. It is a film called Little Nemo Adventures in Slumberland. From the director of Home Alone. Yippee! a magical tale for the entire family. Welcome to Slumberland, my boy. When a little boy has big dreams, anything is possible. Your Majesty, may I present Little Nemo? And every wish can come true. I hear my crown you, Prince Nemo. Let the celebration begin. Take off on a wondrous adventure with a young explorer. It will be Prince Nemo's solemn duty to protect Slumberland from the Nightmare King as I have done. Little Nemo, Adventures in Slumberland. So, for years... Sounds really familiar. When I referred to Nemo, I was referring to Little Nemo, Adventures in Slumberland, and it drove me crazy once Finding Nemo came out, and everyone would be like, Nemo! And I'd be like, yeah, but like, Have you ever seen Little Nemo? And they're like, yeah, the the movie with the fish. And I'm like, "Eh, no. I'll do you one better. I always thought of Captain Nemo from the (laughs) Jules Verne book, not either the fish or the kid in pajamas. That's more respectable, though, yeah. (laughs) With his little monocle as a child. So for anybody unfamiliar, uh, Little Nemo was a movie directed by uh, Masami Hata and William Hurt's Written or like a screenplay done by uh, Richard Oten or Outen and Chris Columbus. Uh, so it's the team that worked on things like uh, like Gremlins and I think Chris Columbus did uh, Home Alone, like all of those types of things. The first but Harry the, Potter. Oh, uh, which one? The first Harry Potter. Oh, oh yeah. So I yes, don't know if this it was is... his team, but he directed it. But yeah. anyway. But um, so anybody who knows me may not be surprised by the pick. So I've. As I said, like, I've championed Little Nemo since I was a kid and was elated when they finally transferred it to DVD because I only had my VHS in the big, chunky plastic box. And I watched it to the point where I was worried that it would be just, like, lost to time someday because you couldn't transfer it at the time and I had no way of kind of getting it on DVD. So it was great when I finally ended up getting it, like, years later. I think it was, like, 17 when they released on DVD or something. 
but the the movie is based on Little Nemo and Slumberland comics by Windsor McKay and follows the little boy Nemo that we're introduced to through like his opening dream sequence of him flying through the streets and then flying through like over the water in his bed and all this. He wakes up and asks to go to the circus with his family and he brings his flying squirrel Icarus. Again, long story short, he eventually goes to bed and ends up being approached by like these characters to bring him to Slumberland to become the official friend of like the princess and take over for King Morpheus of Slumberland handling all of the kind of the dream world and all of this. He ends up befriending a hobo clown, I think Flip, voiced by Mickey Rooney, who gets him into trouble, and they end up releasing the Nightmare King, who takes over Slumberland, and hijinks ensue. Uh, So this is one of those movies that kind of reinforced my imagination as a kid, kind of my fascination as a child with, like, dreaming, and I was excited to go to bed just because of the concept of, like, oh, I can... all these different cool things, so... It had this odd dreamy quality into it or in it of drifting through dreams, flying ships, this like candy lands and all sorts of wacky things that kind of clicked. Um, so like overall, this will always be my favorite animated movie and is definitely worth a watch for anybody that has kids um, or themselves are young at heart. I don't, I've definitely never seen this. That The title sounds familiar, but like nothing about it looks familiar. Ah, it's so good. I had a grudge against it growing up. <laughs> I don't know why. I saw like a trailer, and as a kid, I was just like, I don't want to watch this, and always avoided it. <laughs> just like a spiteful stance. Yeah. I find this to be pandering to my demographic. <laughs> I no, don't think you, sir. I will have no adventures in Slumberland. <laughs> None. No, thank you. <laughs> I mean, I, he gets King Morpheus's staff at some point, like a scepter, um, and he has to say the magic words to fight off like to cast spells and fight off the the goblins and the nightmare creatures and uh his Bloody spell Mary. was Shazama Bloody Pajama. Mary. Oh. It wasn't yeah. the correct spell. It was just like part of what he could remember and it was the only part like I think he was like mispronouncing it too, so it just became him like his mantra of Shazama Pajama, Shazama Pajama as it was like turning the scepter into like a phaser as he was blasting things. <laughs> <laughs> is that all you can remember? And uh, that is Kills a, his friends a by phrase accident. that will always stick in my head. And so it shall be in mine. So definitely check it out. It's fun. It's a movie that you turn on late at night because it, all of the, the dreamy, like going through the dreams and then Slumberland and all of this stuff. Like in my head, there's a lot of different movies that make sense of, yeah, this is a movie you watch in daytime. This is a movie you watch like, at night this is a movie you watch deep at night or like into the early morning kind of deal and this is one of the ones that i think of in terms of like a late at night movie Scary so get your kids and turn it on at 1 a.m do you did you as a did you try to lucid dream after you saw this uh, i controlled my dreams yeah i as a child i read a lot of books on lucid dreaming um <laughs> the the government actually tapped me for a while as part of their dreamscape program that you might have seen in that Dennis Quaid film. No. You've never seen I it? Definitely, oh, oh, another definitely sidebar. Didn't. It's it's not animated, but watch Dreamscape with uh, Dennis Quaid. I'll probably pick it as an episode at some point. Noted. Uh, it's Inception meets Little Nemo. When you close your eyes, the adventure begins. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I was taught not to say anything. If I don't have anything nice to say, I was letting you have your moment. Oh, no, go ahead. That's all Rip, I got. What do you got on Little Nemo? That's all I got. He doesn't. He's never seen it. He has nothing. Yeah. He can't say anything about it. It's a childhood grudge for no reason. <laughs> you have them. I know. I'll force them to watch it. Please don't. I wonder, like, did it preempt something you were watching one time? They're like, oh, I'm sorry. Maybe. We're not going to be oh. playing uh, Aladdin and the 40 Thieves. I, I just think. Little Nemo. Like, if I met the kid in person while I was the same age, he and I would not be friends. You'd, like, kick sand in his face? I probably would. <laughs> or something a lot more passive-aggressive. I'm known for that, so. <laughs> Get out of here, kid. Just, I, I don't know. It just rubbed me the wrong way. I didn't like I didn't like the trailer. I didn't like the how he acted or talked. And just, I don't know. It just wasn't for me. So, so for all you listeners out there, watch... Nick. Little Nemo Adventures in Slumberland and uh, hashtag us uh, Team Tim or Team Nick. <laughs> <laughs> that's, 
That's going to be a thing, I guess. I'll be lawful neutral. True neutral. Chaotic neutral. So, Nick, your number one animated film. So, eventually, we're going to have a discussion on a possible rule of thirds episode of, like, tropes that you probably will do that next. But, like, tropes that we don't agree with in movies. Oh. And um, this movie does the exact opposite of those tropes and it's why it's one of my most favorite and also most recent and it is wally also from disney 700 years in the future robots will help us live our lives it's the new you honey but on june 27th there will be only one robot wally earth is in trouble we can't live without 10 seconds to self-destruct <laughs> Now free to move about the cabin. Disney Pixar's Wally. Rated G in theaters June 27. Um, You're gonna see Star Wars. The <laughs> new ones. What new one? Oh, oh, those. Yeah, huh? Funny. The ones um, that subvert. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. It's not this episode, Dean. Not, not yet. <laughs> um, almost. Wally. I was so impressed. Growing up, I really liked that movie, um, Short Circuit, and Wally reminded me a lot of the robot Johnny Five, which would probably be one of my own episodes in the future. Mm. But what impressed me the most about Wally is for the first, like, I don't know, maybe like 20, 30 minutes, there is zero dialogue. None. It is a hundred percent show, don't tell. And all the 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 dialogue that there is there is just through forced exposition but done respectfully and pretty wisely so with the president of the united states or or whoever um the actor was also the only known um actual real live action segment in a pixar film but he, the guy is explaining that you know we f- <laughs> we fucked up the earth is destroyed and there's no way to recover it immediately. So we're all going to go off in a spaceship. And while we're away, we're going to have these robots clean it up for us. Cause we just junked it too much. And while you're gone, the robots will do this. And then when you come back, everything will be nice and clean. But the way that it's done is so like, it's, it's not forced exposition. It's just like on a shitty screen. That's just on repeat for the last thousand years, which I thought was clever. And then finally, if you haven't seen the movie, the that's a movie follows a, the life of a cleaning robot on a deserted planet Earth. He discovers something which, during the entire time that the humans are away, they've been sending probes to Earth just to see, is Earth habitable again? Wally meets this probe named Eve, and he falls in love with her. She is programmed to just find signs of, you know, life returning to Earth and then bring it back to the mothership off in deep space. But the way that they're able to portray that they they only say their names to each other almost like it's like they're Pokemon talking to each other. You know, he says his name's Wally. She says her name's Eve. And then that's that's really it. They don't really have much more conversation besides that. And then being able to explain everything through just facial expressions as limited as they were and just the actions that they do between each other, I thought was not ever really seen before. And I greatly appreciate that. The rest of the movie is cool, too. I love Sigourney Weaver. The fact that she's the <laughs> voice of the ship that I thought that was like really cool. But <laughs> yeah, but I, I agree as far as it's nice to see more modern things doing that style of like here's a a wordless sequence or something for like 10 minutes of just setting a stage setting up this story just watch it and you'll be able to understand everything that's going on it's almost like it's harkening back to like a like a silent era in terms of storytelling on some of this which i i feel like not everything does when you have when you're talking about like a kids movie so it's cool to be able to see that and hopefully kids watching it are able to just kind of appreciate it even if it's not i haven't been a kid in a very long time i don't remember if i was looking for the talking parts or if i just wanted the pictures but yeah it's 
it's nice that they have that switch up for it. The only other instance I can think of is I think uh, <laughs> the opening to up the entire like wordless thing. I was, and I was just thinking that different. too, unlike how they perfected it to the point where they could make a grown man cry in five minutes or less by just watching <laughs> the intro to up. I, I think to this day, the reason why I don't like up is a good movie. I personally don't want to watch it again. I think because the intro to that movie ruined the rest of it for me because by the time we got to that i was like fool i'm exhausted <laughs> i have a youtube video called how to make a grown man cry in five minutes or less <laughs> is it just the intro to up <laughs> this is just a compilation of everything that i've admitted to over the past several episodes <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like a stephen king kind of thing like it's it's personal to everybody who watches it it's just a it's like a monkey's paw um <laughs> <laughs> it just sure just shows you your faults and that that's pretty much it it's gonna um, be more than five minutes <laughs> uh wally and eve are gonna be on the new uh, smash brothers game wait really no i don't think oh no. but just <laughs> say wow <laughs> what kind of a weird be? choice he's gonna yeah, have to fight robbie the robot i spitefully hate wally because it shits on my dream of like never walking again and floating on a chair um <laughs> you got some time though you, you, you say we're all sitting it. here on the internet <laughs> your grand great grandkids they have that problem maybe <laughs> um yeah wally's great for all the reasons you listed i'm trying to remember like is is like half the movie on earth and the like the point i'm i can't remember what point in the story it's like it transitions to the, the spaceship because doesn't she find them she finds like the, the, the thing yeah. and then she goes back up and he follows her back up yeah i'd say maybe kick a off third? like the second act yeah i think okay. a third of the yeah movie. that makes sense though it's been a while i think i only saw wally fully once like in the theater that might have been the only time i watched it through yeah this felt during that weird time that i was old enough that i wasn't watching every disney movie as a kid but i wasn't old to the point where i all of a sudden got back into being like yeah i'll just go to a theater and just watch the movie like just for the fun of it kind of deal so I think I missed things in theaters like Op and Wally and whatnot because it was that middle ground of, yeah, the only time I'm probably going to see this is because my parents will buy all of the DVDs and I'll just happen to be visiting and see it. Up, uh, not so. up. Um, Wally was a blockbuster movie. Yeah, yeah. I'll have to give it another shot. I remember liking it. I just can't for the life of me remember much about it other than maybe like two scenes. Wally. That's the one. Wally. That was me playing both roles. <laughs> Maybe we should I, do I'd that like as my the check, radio. please. The radio uh, <laughs> show a, we're doing. A radio play? Yeah. That's it. We're done. <laughs> Just clip it, and then we'll release it next week. <laughs> Good job. Just use auto-tune to make I the I thought emotion. we would do uh, Little Nemo Adventures in Slumberland. I quit. And Nick can finally correct his nope. Nemo's Your transgressions. Notes. I quit right now. You my can be Little Nemo. Nope. I refuse to say that stupid spell. Like, no. <laughs> That's fine. Nope. We'll have somebody else rather it say in. when God and Leviosa. We'll have Frank Welker do it. It's like when they brought in uh, somebody to just do the one line as Super Shredder for Kevin Nash, <laughs> which actually I think was also Frank Welker. Uh, I think it was Kevin Michael Richardson. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. or was it Kevin Clash? Yes. Wait. No, he's Splinter. Yeah, you're right. I think it, yeah. Kevin Clash. You're right. Sorry tangent so who Wally. plays the fat people of the <laughs> isn't there isn't john there... ratzenberger <laughs> <laughs> i think he was isn't the there like a main like like fat person that's like the not the leader of the fat people <laughs> they focus on like one or two of them i thought but maybe i'm wrong oh jeff garland is the captain john ratzenberger plays john <laughs> sigourney weaver is the computer Fred Willard is the president. I knew his name. Okay, was I remember him. Yeah. And then I forget the woman that he, that John kind of meets and falls for. Oh. Oh, I think it's from Kathy, um, Hocus uh, Pocus. Jimmy. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. A like kiss, her. a kiss. She's funny. And that's my pick. Wally. So I, I think overall, not, we did have dis well, not we, you guys had Disney picks on it, but it wasn't. Only, f only four of the nine. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think it was just like a 
the expected list of Disney movies. Some of them, like, granted, yeah, like Toy Story, Aladdin, naturally they're going to be on lists of best animated films. They're absolute classics. I'm surprised we don't have Hercules on it. That did make my my honorable uh, mention list. I think Hercules to this day is the best theater experience I've had of watching him like wow. fight the Hydra and fight the Titans on the big screen as a that kid a that just movie. blew my mind. Yeah. I love Greek mythology. So that, that is a fun, yeah. one of the fun Disney movies. So it's like, it's a Rip great, Torn um, is amazing as Zeus and, oh yeah, um, he is, he is really good. James Woods as Hades is, his, that's his favorite role. Anytime you ask him, can you reprise your role as Hades? He's there every single time. Because <laughs> he just gets to smarm and sass it up and like yeah. be a dickhead. Which, again, <laughs> casting James Woods, which, like, James Woods currently aside, like, James Woods as Hades loved him. But Disney, looking at his past things and being like, I saw a video drone. <laughs> that guy. He's going to be in the new Disney film. Well, I mean, like, Jeremy Irons, I think of like smooth collective criminal and villain in all of the other movies he's done. And then he yeah, was he the, the villain star. in Die Hard with a Vengeance with like yeah. the bleached hair? Mm-hmm. That came after that came after Lion King? Uh, I believe so, yeah, because Lion King was ninety four. The brother of Hans. I forget his name. Franz. Um <laughs> We had to pump you up. So I guess that leads us into are there any honorable mentions you guys haven't honorably mentioned, or would you prefer to keep that list for a future episode? I almost broke the rules and said Frisky Dingo. Oh, I would be down for a, an animated show episode. Because, well, well I just ruined it. I don't consider it a show. <laughs> I consider it a movie because a five minute show is ridiculous. Oh, it's a short film. Yeah. It's so true, because yeah, if whenever you I layer it, all the episodes back to back, it's probably like seventy-five minutes or something. Yeah, I mean, so I think of it like a supercut. Things, and even though it might be considered a three-hour movie, it's just it's a supercut. So it's just all of the five-minute episodes in one compilation, because it flows a lot better as a tele as a as a movie than it does as a television show. I think. Get out, sir. <laughs> I thought one of you were going to go like the Who Framed Roger Rabbit route. Was that was uh, also my other yeah. honorable mention, but I want to have a dedicated episode for that. Yeah, that is one of my absolute favorites. Because that does toe the line. And actually, it was it was Who Framed Roger Rabbit was the reason why I was asking about like, so how far are we saying like animated? Because yeah. that's what I was actually referencing, because it is technically an animated movie. Yeah, like there's a certain like certain movies in my life that I think of in terms of a perfect movie that there's nothing that I can think of that I would change. And Roger Rabbit is one of them. So, Trey yeah, if that's case, I'll, I'll save the rest of mine for another another day. There's a why isn't why isn't the page master? One of that's one movies? of them. It was it was actually it was Rockadoodle, page master, Coraline, all things we've mentioned already. Uh, the only difference is I also had Akira on that list, uh, and then three Scooby Doo movies: Scooby Doo and the Boo Brothers, Scooby Doo and the Ghoul School, Scooby Doo and the Reluctant Werewolf. Coraline was on how's that? Too. How's that Street Fighter movie? Is that like not? Is that a bad movie? No, it's, really it's good. good. Street Fighter Two, the movie. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty. It good. is not for kids. There yeah. is nudity. Oh. Not oh, expected. Blanca? Full <laughs> full dong. Full dong. <laughs> it's fun fact. It's not green. <laughs> Blanca Dong. Watch the movie to find out. <laughs> no, that like, scene uh, that scene dreams. really caught me off guard considering I was it was just fan service to a degree of just I wasn't expecting to see that. You see, John, tell me what it is. I, now I want to watch it. Okay. I feel uh, like it's also it's watch like when I mentioned the action channel as a kid of catching these random anime things, a lot of times growing up it would be a case of my brother would have to, he was older, so he would tape it for me and have to watch it and see in the beginning if it said like, oh, uh, nudity or sexual situations. If it didn't, then I can sit and watch it too. If not, then he had to record it, confirm that there wasn't anything bad in it, and then I was allowed to watch the recording with him later. I would watch it later without him out of spite. <laughs> yeah. So. 
Oh, the the last honorable Gate mention out of my Gate. list was Cowboy Bebop the movie, Knocking on Heaven's Door. Which, when I finally get a Cowboy Bebop podcast, we'll do that, Dean. Is that inspired by the Bob Dylan song? or So, uh, a fun fact, I believe all the episodes of Cowboy Bebop, I don't know if it's just a majority, but they're all named after, like, classic rock songs and whatnot. So, like, Toys in the Attic, uh, Honky Tonk Woman, like, all sorts of things like that. So, Alrighty. it's a fun fact. It's true. Okay, you guys got any closing thoughts on animated films? It it was harder than I thought. Like it's, of course, I grew up watching a lot of animation, but mostly I think of cartoons. So it was kind of, I don't know. I realize I don't. There's, I feel like I'm less diverse with animation than I could be. Well, it's not and, so much uh, that you haven't seen a lot of them too. It's just, can you vouch for three? Because I know you could name like 15, 20 animated movies if you right. really needed to right now, but to vouch for three of them, that's where the difficulty came. Because that was yeah. the same thing, too. Like, a lot of your n- movies that you named tonight, Tim, I, I could have said the same thing, but I couldn't vouch for them. Yeah. I could barely vouch for The Land Before Time. It was like... I it... Yeah. That one was <laughs> tough. I really wanted to say it, but I hadn't seen it since childhood. I, it's just all I yeah. remember on the VHS. I don't know if yours had it. There was like a Pizza Hut commercial on it. Oh, Jerome, a birthday party at Pizza Hut. What fun. <laughs> you bet, Mom. Okay, sweetie. Have a good time. Don't forget to share. Share, share. Use your silverware. Goodbye, Jerome. Be nice to the little girls. Honey, did you have a good time? I did everything you said. I was even nice to a girl. Oh, my little angel. Yeah. Those were popular back then. That sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to, but that's, I remember the Pizza Hut commercial more than I do the actual movie itself in terms of detail. Cause I remember the big plot lines, but like tree star and you know, mom dying and yep, yep, yep. But So our next rule of thirds is going to be the best pre movie trailers and commercials on VHS that we grew up on. I think we should do top three, um, land before time movies. <laughs> <laughs> bye okay gang that wraps up another episode <laughs> okay gang that wraps up another episode of rule of thirds and we'd like to thank you for coming along for the ride and discussing our favorite animated films as always you can reach us on instagram twitter facebook at screen refresh or shoot an email at screen refresh at gmail.com let us know what your top three are or if you have any topics you want to hear us discuss that's it for us so for nick and dean this is tim Have a great week and catch us next on Screen Refresh the first Monday of the month. Wally. Spriggan. Show me that Blanca dong.